Hi, this is Peter Clayton with the Total Picture Podcast. Joining me today is Frank Cespedes. He's the MBA class of 1973 senior lecturer of business administration at Harvard Business School. He's run a business, consulted with companies around the world, and has been a board member of corporations and startup firms. At Harvard, he teaches entrepreneurial marketing, heads the executive program on linking strategy and sales, and also teaches in the owner-president management program for CEOs. Before Harvard, he worked at Bain and & Company, and from 1995 to 2007, he was managing partner at the Center for Executive Development, a firm that won awards in the United States and Europe for its work with companies worldwide. He has written for numerous publications and is the author of six books. His latest is titled Sales Management That Works, published by Harvard Business Review Press. Frank, welcome back to the Total Picture Podcast. Peter, it's absolutely my pleasure, and thank you very much for welcoming me back. Thank you. You know, my first impression in reading your new book is that sales management that works will work for just about anyone trying to run or get ahead in business. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, you know, in some sense, you're asking me who's the book aimed at. Exactly. You know, I, I think uh, I think you've got it right. Uh, my book is aimed at business people that want to grow their business. And uh, if you know of a way to grow a business without engaging in profitable selling, let me know. I'll, <laughs> I'll invest. Uh, and my motivations in writing the book and focusing it on sales are really twofold, uh, very briefly. One uh, is what you might call a professional motivation. Of all the different functions in business, sales is the most context specific. Uh, Selling software is different than selling capital goods, is different than selling professional services. Selling enterprise software is different than selling software as a service. Selling in the US is different than selling in Asia, the Middle East, et cetera. Very context specific. But of all the functions, for some reason, sales is the area where people feel most comfortable making these huge generalizations that are usually based on nothing more than, as we say in academia, N equals one. When I worked at Google, when we (laughs) invested in PayPal. So, you know, I, I wanna write a book that says, here's what research does and doesn't tell you about this activity. And I think it's a particularly good time for a book like this for two reasons. One is there is clearly a data revolution going on in sales as in many other areas. And I think the pandemic has raised the stakes for getting this right. So, you know, my my audience are people that run a profit and loss, uh, clearly salespeople and sales managers, but also investors. Uh, They already, whether they realize it or not, they already spent a ton of money on this activity. Yeah, and I think you're you're so right when you bring up this this thing about how to hire uh, sales folks and you know we've all heard about you know sales rock stars and this person was a natural born sales person. There are I, I hate to sound like a parody of the Harvard professor Peter, you know, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. There are such things as stars in sales. But stardom is, um, is not very portable. Uh, let, me, let me begin there. And then if you wish, we could we okay. can go into more depth about hiring. Um, there are stars in sales. The, the variance in individual performance in sales is very, very wide, as it is in most creative occupations. You'll see the same thing in computer programming, in um, in the creative arts uh, and other areas. The point being that the best, you know, think of it as the top 10% are usually not just a little bit better than the average person in that line of work, but frankly, they're a heck of a lot better, usually, you know, 100 to 200% better. And in sales, this is very, very much the case. You know, people call it the 80 20 rule. And it is a very widespread phenomenon. The the top 20% Mm -hmm. of the sales force are often generating 80% of the sales. So if that's what we mean by a rock star, 
they exist in sales. The issue, however, is that again, it's very context and organization specific. Uh, I have a colleague, his name is Boris Groisberg, wrote a wonderful book documenting this a couple of years ago about how so much of performance in many occupations is organizational specific. Yes, it's the skills of the person, but it's also the relationships that they establish in that company. Especially important in sales, because it's not only about external client relationships, it's also about internal relationships. And you know, one way to think about this, think about how many companies you know that you know we hired the rock star from, you know, I don't know, Oracle, whatever. Right. And somehow she didn't perform here the way she performed there. That person didn't suddenly get stupid. They didn't suddenly lose their capabilities, but they've got to recreate those networks at the new company. That's not easy to do. So there, there are stars, but stardom is not easily portable, meaning that the practical implication, you got to grow your own. It's that, it's that kind of function. Well, to, to just extend on this a little bit more in the introduction of your book, you write that you know, 20 to 30 percent of salespeople who are hired fail in, in their role. And that's that is a huge number. And why do you think that so many in sales don't make it? Well, a couple of things. One is just to clarify the number that 20 to 30 percent figure is not people who, who necessarily fail. That's turnover in sales. Uh, it's, it's obviously higher when economic conditions are good, so people have more options, and it's lower when economic conditions are bad, like during the pandemic. Right. Uh, people have fewer options. They stay where they are. But you are right. There are many, many failures in this occupation. And one of the reasons is uh, the inherent challenges that uh, are true in sales that are simply not true to the same extent in any other function. For example, if you want to hire an engineer, you can go to a engineering school and it's a little bit like walking into a buffet. You know, what do you want? Chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Would you like it with ice cream? You know, they all minor in environmental engineering. If you want someone in finance or accounting, people major in those subjects. Same is true for computer programmers. But of the nearly 5,000 colleges and universities in the United States, last time I looked, which is when I wrote this book, less than 200 even had a sales course, let alone a sales program. So the point is the vast majority of people enter this line of work knowing almost nothing about what they're going to get paid for. That leads to the other data point that's significant. Companies spend per capita 20% more on sales training than any other function. And the reason is they have no choice given the way uh, our system works. But the point is if you add up the cost of hiring, training and development, compensation annually, in most companies just in sales, that number will be as big or bigger as some of their most expensive capital expenditure decisions, but it rarely gets the same attention that those CapEx decisions do. People, most companies are more rigorous when they're buying software than when they're hiring salespeople. And the turnover cost of salespeople, yeah. as you write, is extraordinary. I mean, you write in, in some industries, it can be up to a million dollars to lose a top salesperson. Yeah, per rep. That's per right. Rep. That's not, and that's not counting the opportunity cost. Right. Meaning, we, you know, there's some time when somebody's not selling there. That's exactly right. So the subtitle of your book is How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. And you cite a number of examples to illustrate this concept. So Tell us about the transition from funnels, check your, whatever your, your CRM is, to streams. Yeah. 
Um, here's the basic um, uh, thesis of the book, and and I don't think I don't think the um, the empirical fact I'm about to cite is original to me, although I I think I did some of the original research in the area, but others have demonstrated this. But I want to step back. The most important thing about selling in any market, tech or non-tech, is the buyer, not the seller, but the buyer. Who buys, why, and how? And that is changing significantly and quickly because of technology. What used to be a sequential funnel, right? That's the jargon you typically hear in sales. People talk about funnels, pipelines, et cetera. A, a sequential process is less and less true about buying in most markets. The, the prospect is online and offline at multiple times throughout that buying journey, what we call omni-channel buying. Right. Now, that's a big deal. What it does not mean is the elimination or as we now say, the disintermediation of the salesperson. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been hearing predictions about this for the last 30 years, but if you look at the number of salespeople in the United States, that number has increased steadily throughout the 21st century, even as you know the internet has gotten uh, more and more powerful and the official number almost certainly vastly undercounts the number of people who sell, because in especially in a service economy, 80% of our GDP is service, which is why the pandemic has been, you know, an economic catastrophe. Uh, but in an economy like that, you know, many people who work in companies uh, who sell for a living are not, never called salespeople. They're called associates, mm -hmm. or partners. You know, think about a bank. Everybody who works in a bank right. is a vice president, but business development is what they do. So, um, you know, that's that's an important factor behind uh, the the good question you're asking. You know, one of the statistics in your book that I I didn't know was that uh, you know co college graduates, uh, fifty percent of college graduates at some point in their career are going to be in a sales role. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, which shouldn't surprise us. If again, you think about how services dominated our economy is 80% of our economy is services. And again, many of those roles are not called sales for labor department, uh, labor department reporting purposes, but that's what they are. They're, they're responsible for business Development. One of the major consulting firms, um, I think, has a wonderful ritual. It's a it's a firm where, on average, it takes almost a decade, ten years, to make partner. Uh, and you know that's like getting right. tenure in a university. And the ritual is, if you finally make partner in that firm, the managing partner of that office where you work comes to you and says, congratulations, welcome to the sales force, right? Now, those people are never called salespeople, but in a, in a professional services firm, that's what they do. Their job is to bring in the next client. You know, you can call that whatever you want. You and I know it's called business development. Right. Yeah, so, you know, you, an, another aspect of sales that is evolving uh, is the relationship between marketing and sales, which for a long time has been sort of uh, arbitrary or competitive. Uh, what has your research revealed? Well, first of all, you, you are right about for a long time, uh, it hasn't exactly been uh, the most uh, friendly relationship right. in the world. I wrote a book 25 years ago about this. And in the book, the first few chapters of that book document that this is an issue that goes back to the 19th century, right? Now, whenever you see an issue in business that persists for over 100 years, I think you have to be a little humble. You have to step back and say, wow, there's probably a lot of money and a lot of smart people that focused on that issue, and yet it's still here. 
right? So it's, it's probably not an easy fix. Marketing and sales are different jobs. Marketers get paid to think in terms of segments, groups, markets. Salespeople, if they know what they're doing, they should be able to cite chapter and verse about specific accounts, specific buyers. It's different jobs, usually different metrics, different data that is relevant. What is changing now, and again, technology is a big part of this, especially in tech businesses, right? Especially in subscription tech businesses. As a general statement, what technology is doing is now allowing the sales organization to do things that as recently as a decade ago would clearly have been a marketing task. Content marketing in a SaaS business is a perfect example, right? right? It's used for lead generation. You know, the techs, tech people love to call it content marketing. 20 years ago, you and I called it white papers, right? Now we put it on a website. That was clearly marketing's domain intended to generate leads, thought leadership. Now in many of these models, sales, the sales organization does this. The issue is, do they really know what they're doing? So that relationship is uh, more interdependent than ever, marketing and sales. But if, as a general rule, if you're asking who's sort of gaining power and leverage in that relationship, by and large, it's sales. And that's an important issue. It's an important human resource issue because it means you, there's a skill base there that has to be developed. I know you can't get too specific uh, without getting specific about the role, but what are some generalizations you can make about hiring salespeople that would work a, a, across all industries? Yeah, um, big topic. Uh, as you know, yeah. Um, but a couple of generalizations. First, um, you know, I think um, my attitude in many areas of business is that the Hippocratic Oath is relevant not only to doctors but to people in business as well. First, do no harm. And frankly, hiring in sales, for reasons I mentioned earlier, is tough. It presents its own challenges. But many standard practices there make a tough job even tougher, right? The first thing is right now there is a dramatic over-reliance on unstructured interviews by the sales manager. Now, the research I'm about to cite is supported by over 60 years of consistent results. And I want to emphasize this, consistent results. This is as close to a fact as anything you'll ever hear from a management professor. The correlation between the ratings that people get in interviews and their actual subsequent on-the-job performance tend to vary from about 0.1 to 0.4. Even in the best of cases, it's less than the 50-50 odds of flipping a coin. And especially in service jobs, of which sales is the quintessential example, it tends to be at the lower end of that range. So the first thing is don't rely simply on interviews and certainly not by one interview, by one person. Get multiple interviews, multiple assessments, especially in sales, not only interviews by people from sales, people from HR. They often know more about interviewing than the sales manager does. People in service, they have to deal with the outcomes of what the people in sales actually sell. So that would be uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I would say is make sure that you know what you're doing uh, with using assessments because that's a very big uh, growing area and what they're not good for. You know, especially in sales hiring, I see a lot of people using Myers-Briggs, for example, as an assessment. Mm -hmm. Myers-Briggs was never, ever designed to be a hiring diagnostic, right? So the first thing is, is there a fit? Secondly, there's a lot of, I think, legitimate questions about its reliability, 
right? You give the Myers-Briggs test to me in January, you get one result. You give it to me six months later, you get another result. Not exactly a scientific instrument. And then the third issue is even if it were a good assessment, how many sales managers have been trained in how to administer and interpret assessments? So if you're going to use assessments and there are some out there that are good and they do, you know, they they minimize bias, which is a very important thing. Make sure you're using the right ones for the right purposes and that the people using them know uh, what they're doing. And then the third uh, bit of advice I'd give Peter is hire for the task, not the title. And what I mean by that, it gets me back to my initial point. Sales is very context specific. It's not good enough for hiring purposes to say, we want someone who can develop relationships. Of course we do, but what kind of relationships? Where in the sailing cycle are those relationships built or destroyed? So make sure you understand the tasks and then hire for that task and not the title. There's a huge amount of degree inflation that takes place in sales hiring. Some of that is justified because sales is becoming a more data intensive activity, but most of it is just laziness. Most of it is based on very dubious assumptions. Well, if this person went to this school, they must be good at X, Y, and Z. No, that is not necessarily the case at all. So th that would be my three major recommendations about that very, very big and crucial topic of hiring. All right. Well, now I have two more questions for you. The first one is, as we know, uh, a lot of companies today are using video interviews and there are video, video interview products like HireVue, which uh, pretend to use artificial intelligence to watch the movements and the eye contact of the people being interviewed. And supposedly that will give you a psychological profile of that individual. So what is your opinion of hiring through video interviews? Well, I, I think let's make a distinction here because there's video interviews uh, and during a pandemic, that's probably a pretty good process right. as opposed to coming into the office. But then there's the claims, and you're exactly right about this, the claims about what it is we can tell you about that person's personality or capabilities because of their um, uh, body language in, um, uh, in, in the uh, video interview. Those claims, I think, are very, very dubious. Uh, I, I've not seen a lot of evidence that those claims are relevant. Uh, and again, that's independent of doing the video interview. The important thing, whether you're doing the interview by video, whether you're doing it face to face, and when you're trying to use some kind of predictive analytics in hiring, sales is the ultimate performance art. It's ultimately not simply about attitude or how well somebody presents themselves in an interview. It's about their actual behavior on the job. And what this says is you wanna complement interviews, video, face-to-face, -face, assessments, or no assessments. Whenever possible, you wanna complement those with some kind of behavioral task. And it might actually be some kind of internship some kind of period where these people actually work. And by the way, the pandemic is making that more available to companies because of the economic carnage uh, that it mm -hmm. has wrought. So again, the, the only uh, distinction I'd make is nothing wrong with video interviews per se, but take these claims about, um, you know, our algorithm's ability to figure out if your eye twitch means X or Y, with more than a couple of grains of salt. The, the evidence for that is, is very sketchy at this point. So the other thing I wanted to bring up with you is 
uh, and, and you talked about bias a little bit, is it seems companies today are really taking the whole aspect of diversity and inclusion far more seriously than they took it in the past. And how does that relate to sales roles? Yeah, well, in one sense, um, this isn't news for most salespeople, right? Right. Uh, because again, um, look, if you're selling to a predominantly African-American uh, customer base, you don't need to tell a profit maximizing executive might be a good idea to have African Americans on your sales force. I mean, they've known that for years. Same is true with, with women. If you're going to sell to Latinos, you hire, you hire someone like me. I think that's always been true. And the second thing is sales has always been a relatively welcoming place of for what today we call marginalized communities for the same reason. There's lots of metrics in sales. You know, if, uh, if she can sell, well, darn it, let her sell. That's what the metrics tell us. I think the issues with diversity there have to do with what we've called for decades the glass ceiling. I don't think it's an issue of entry. I don't think it's an issue in an individual contributor's role of getting well paid and being well respected for that. The issues tend to crop up when you're talking about management, but there, Peter, I don't think they are significantly different than, than issues in any other area. In fact, if anything, the sales uh, groups have an advantage here because they usually have a more diverse group of salespeople uh, to choose from than in some other areas of the business. Well, since you brought up compensation, Frank, let's talk a little bit about compensation and sales, which gets into some pretty gnarly weeds. Yeah. Does it not? Well, I mean, you know, a couple of general comments here. Um, uh, Any interview I ever do about any book I've ever written, compensation comes up, right? People love to talk about it. Um, And, um, you know, I'd say a couple of things about that. I do have colleagues who, will tell you that compensation doesn't count, that people work uh, for purpose, uh, uh, for intrinsic rewards, as we say, not the extrinsic rewards. All I can say is that's not the planet I've lived on for over 50 years. I do think compensation counts, but so do the intrinsic rewards. You gotta think about compensation and sales as a necessary but not sufficient cause of getting the behavior you want. So that's principle number one. Principle number two, and again, once I say this, I think it will sound obvious, but it, um, it's been pretty amazing to me how smart, well-educated people tend to forget this in business. There is no such thing as effective selling if that selling doesn't link to your firm's strategy and goals. Might be good for the individual salesperson and his family, but it's not necessarily good for the value of the enterprise and so forth. And that's where compensation is important. Part of the purpose of compensation should be to link the incentives for salespeople with what the company's doing to increase its value so that when they win, we win. Now, here's a big issue in sales. This would be my third bit of advice. The the data I'm about to cite has been remarkably consistent throughout my career. It varies by maximum about five percentage points each year. If you look at the incentive component of most sales compensation plans around the world, you know, the point, the portion of the comp plan that depends on how much you sell, how much I sell. Uh, In 70% of those plans, it's tied simply to top line volume. End of chapter, end of paragraph, end of sentence. In other words, how much the salesperson sells, not how profitable that sale is, not what the cost to serve that customer is, 
uh, not the price at which it's sold, but simply the volume. Notice what the message is to salespeople in a plan like that. The message is there is no such thing as a bad customer. Go forth and multiply. And very soon, that's what they do. And very soon, it really doesn't matter what the company's leaders think their strategy is. The real strategy is the ad hoc process that the comp plan is incenting in the field. So, you know, those are my three headlines about compensation. And I think you have to think those three things through before you worry about the numbers. And I'm going to use here a wonderful American phrase, Peter. Many companies, when it comes to sales comp, do it exactly bass backwards. They start with the numbers, bring in the comp consultant. What's the market rate? That sort of thing. Then... They worry about these other things, but that's getting it completely backwards. So uh, just a couple of more questions for you, Frank, and I really appreciate your time today. Um, You note that many businesses, uh, sales is treated like a mysterious black box sealed off from the rest of the company. So what what can be done to open that up and make it more part of the organization as a whole? First, you're right, uh, that is true, but it's, it's also changing as a result of the data revolution. And um, let, me, let me say a few words about that as well, Peter. Absolutely. This, I think, is very relevant to your, um, uh, your audience. Um, here, let me start with an anecdote. This is an anecdote that I've experienced four times as board member of different companies. Um, sales VP has to make a presentation to the board. He or she makes that presentation. Then the board goes into executive session. And uh, people, you know, sort of go, (laughs) and then someone says, you know, I don't think he really understood the question. Uh, I'm not sure that his answer was sufficient. But, you know, he makes his numbers every quarter. Let's leave him alone. Those days are gone. That's what I mean by the black box, right? Mm -hmm. Sales is typically, look, make your numbers every quarter, we'll leave you alone. But that is changing in a hurry. And the reason is, again, the data revolution. There's more and more data available. It's becoming a more transparent activity. And among other things, now the finance function gets that data. For example, again, if you look at tech firms, Fast, one of the fast growing occupations there is sales operations. They're all about the metrics. If you look at about half the people in sales ops in tech firms, they've never been in the sales function. They report up through finance. And finance people are annoying. Once they get that data, they start to ask questions. Well, how do you allocate this money? What is your cost to serve, et cetera? So, The black box has existed historically, but it is changing, and that has implications for people who want to go into sales. It has implications for their careers. And one implication is that the level of financial literacy required in sales is increasing significantly, very, very much so, because... Now the the people in finance ask questions and they want answers beyond, oh, just trust me. That that doesn't do as an answer anymore. Frank, what did you, what surprised you or what did you learn in doing the research for sales management that works? Uh, Again, that that may have been somewhat of a surprise to you. Well, I mean, I think the, probably the single biggest surprise, and and this is actually quite timely uh, because people are making big, big bets about what's going to happen, you know, post-COVID, what we now call the new normal. Um, I'm going to cite some data that tends to surprise people. Um, 2019, in other words, before the pandemic, uh, what was the percentage of retail sales in the United States that was e-commerce. Now, when I ask people that question, I typically get estimates between 30 to 60%. And the data, the actual number is about 11 and a half percent. 
right? That was before the pandemic. Now, if you look at this, you the same question during the pandemic, you want to look at the second quarter of 2020, because that was maximum lockdown conditions so far in the United States. Now, obviously, or at least it seems obvious to me, when stores are closed or when their capacity has been decreased by 75%, and when people are legitimately afraid that if they go to a store, they may catch a virus and die, obviously there's gonna be more online buying and selling. But in Q2 of 2020, maximum lockdown conditions, e-commerce as a percentage of total retail sales, 16%. In other words, it only went up 5%. Wow, that surprises the, me. In the third quarter, it was 14.5%. In the fourth quarter, 14%. So it's already trending down. So the, the biggest surprise is all this talk about disintermediation, the new normal is online, virtual. Uh, you want to take that with a grain of salt. That I thought I think, everybody was buying stuff from Amazon. That's what we hear, all right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You see those prime trucks everywhere. No, but but what I do think is real is the reality, which was true before the pandemic, of omni-channel buying. I still sit in meetings where executives debate: should we be online? Should we be brick and mortar? And you know, my answer is the answer to that question is yes. It's the third decade of the 21st century. We have to do both. And I think one of the things the pandemic has demonstrated to many companies is not that everything's going online. That is simply, you know, again, I, I cited the data for you. But what they've learned out of necessity is that, in effect, they were overpaying for many of the tasks in their sales cycle, like lead generation or demos. It turns out you can do a number of them online many meetings where you don't have to fly there. You can use either lower expense people or sometimes even an algorithm. I don't think that will go away after the pandemic, but um, selling and buying have always been social as well as economic transactions. And that's, that's been true for, for thousands of years through multiple pandemics. Yeah, especially in large items, large costly items or enterprise wide items. Yeah. You, you want to see the people, you want to meet the people, you want, you know, that in person thing that you can't get over Zoom. You know, why, why is the data surprising? We're, again, we're living through a data and information revolution. And as that information increases geometrically, the buyer needs a curated experience. Now, again, I don't much care whether we call the group that does that the sales force or the partners or asparagus, but that's, that's the point. And, 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 you know, this will increase throughout our lifetimes. That's not going to go away. Right. Well, Frank, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today here on Total Picture. It's really been uh, a fun interview, and I highly recommend sales management that works. So how can our audience connect with you and with your new book? Well, again, Peter, I want to thank you uh, for, for uh, inviting me. You can get the book on Amazon. Uh, you can get the book direct uh, from the publisher with volume discounts, uh, you know, buy thousands of copies, the price goes go. down, uh, Harvard uh, Business Review uh, Press, any of those people, and you can reach me through the way you can with most people, LinkedIn, and I, I do have a website that uh, uh, talks about the book as well. Great. Well, again, thank, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. Thank you, Peter. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, 
and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com, and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.